Pre-sectarian Buddhism, also called Early Buddhism, the earliest Buddhism, and Original Buddhism, is the Buddhism that existed before the various subsects of Buddhism came into being. Some of the contents and teachings of this pre-sectarian Buddhism may be deduced from the earliest Buddhist texts, which by themselves are already sectarian. Topic name. Various terms are being used to refer to the earliest period of Buddhism. Pre-sectarian Buddhism Early Buddhism The earliest Buddhism Original Buddhism The Buddhism of the Buddha himself Precanonical Buddhism Primitive Buddhism Some Japanese scholars refer to the subsequent period of the early Buddhist schools as sectarian Buddhism. Time span Pre-sectarian Buddhism may refer to the earliest Buddhism, the ideas and practices of Gautama Buddha himself. It may also refer to early Buddhism as existing until about 100 years after the Parinirvana of the Buddha until the first documented split in the Sangha. Contrary to the claim of doctrinal stability, early Buddhism was a dynamic movement. Pre-sectarian Buddhism may have included or incorporated other Shramanic schools of thought, as well as Vedic and Jain ideas and practices. The first documented split occurred, according to most scholars, between the Second Buddhist Council and the Third Buddhist Council. The first post-schismatic groups are often stated to be the Stavira Nikaya and the Mahasamgika. Eventually, 18 different schools came into existence. The later Mahayana schools may have preserved ideas which were abandoned by the Orthodox. Theravada, such as the Three Bodies Doctrine, the idea of consciousness vijnana, as a continuum, and devotional elements such as the worship of saints. <laughs> Earliest Buddhism and the Sramana movement Pre-sectarian Buddhism was originally one of the Shramanic movements. The time of the Buddha was a time of urbanization in India, and saw the growth of the sramanas, wandering philosophers that had rejected the authority of Vedas and Brahmanic priesthood, intent on escaping samsara through various means, which involved the study of natural laws, ascetic practices, and ethical behavior. The sramanas gave rise to different religious and philosophical schools, among which pre sectarian Buddhism itself, Yoga, Jainism, Ahivika, Ajnana, and Karvaka were the most important, and also to popular concepts in all major. Indian religions such as samsara endless cycle of birth and death and moksha liberation from that cycle. Nevertheless, despite the success that these wandering philosophers and ascetics had obtained by spreading ideas and concepts that would soon be accepted by all religions of India, the orthodox schools of Hindu philosophy astika opposed to shramanic schools of thought and refuted their doctrines as heterodox. Nastika, because they refused to accept the epistemic authority of Vedas, denied the existence of the soul and or the existence of Ishvara, supreme god. The ideas of samsara, karma and rebirth show a development of thought in Indian religions, from the idea of single existence, at the end of which one was judged and punished and rewarded for one's deeds, or karma, to multiple existences with reward or punishment in an endless series of existences, and then attempts to gain release from this endless series. This release was the central aim of the Sramana movement. Vedic rituals, which aimed at entrance into heaven, may have played a role in this development. The realization that those rituals did not lead to an everlasting liberation led to the search for other means. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Scholarship and methodology. Earliest Buddhism can only be deduced from the various Buddhist canons now extant, which are all already sectarian collections. As such any reconstruction is tentative. One method to obtain information on the oldest core of Buddhism is to compare the oldest extant versions of the Theravadan Pali Canon, the surviving portions of the scriptures of Sarvastivada, Malasarvastivada, Mahisasaka, Dharmaguptaka and other schools, and the Chinese Agamas and other surviving portions of other early canons such as the Gandharan texts. Early Proto-Mahayana texts which contain nearly identical material to that of the Pali Canon such as the Salastamba Sutra are also further evidence. The beginning of this comparative study began in the 19th century. Samuel Beale published comparative translations of the Pali Pratimaka and the Chinese Dharmaguptaka Pratimaksa 1859, showing they were virtually identical. 
He following this up with comparisons between the Chinese sutras and the Pali Suttas in 1882, accurately predicting that, "...when the Vinaya and Agama collections are thoroughly examined, I can have little doubt we shall find most if not all the Pali Suttas in Chinese form." In the following decades various scholars continued to produce a series of comparative studies, such as Anasaki, Akanuma who composed a complete catalogue of parallels, Yin Shun and Thich Min Chao. These studies, as well as recent work by Anilayo, Marcus Bingenheimer and Moon Keat Chung, have shown that the essential doctrinal content of the Pali Majjhima and Samyutta Nikayas and the Chinese Madhyama and Samyukta Agamas is mostly the same, with, as Anilayo notes, "...occasional divergence in details." According to scholars such as Rupert Gethin and Peter Harvey, the oldest recorded teachings are contained in the first four Nikayas of the Sutta Pitaka and their various parallels in other languages, together with the main body of monastic rules, which survive in the various versions of the Patimaka. Scholars have also claimed that there is a core within this core, referring to some poems and phrases which seem to be the oldest parts of the Sutta Pitaka. The reliability of these sources, and the possibility to draw out a core of oldest teachings, is a matter of dispute. According to Tilman Vetter, the comparison of the oldest extant texts does not just simply lead to the oldest nucleus of the doctrine. At best, it leads to a Stavira canon dating from c. 270 BC when the missionary activities during Ahsoka's reign as well as dogmatic disputes had not yet created divisions within the Stavira tradition. According to Vetter, inconsistencies remain, and other methods must be applied to resolve those inconsistencies. Because of this, scholars such as Edward Kahn's and A. K. Warder have argued that only the material which is common to both the Stavira and the Mahasambhika canons can be seen as the most authentic, since they were the first communities after the first schism. The problem is that there is little material surviving from the Mahasambhika school. However, what we do have, such as the Mahasambhika Pratimaksha and Vinaya, is mostly consistent in doctrine with the Stavira texts. Other Mahasamgika sources are the Mahavasta and possibly the Salastamba Sutra, both of which also contains phrases and doctrines that are found in the Stavira canons. Further exemplary studies are the study on descriptions of liberating insight by Lambert Schmidhausen, the overview of early Buddhism by Tilman Vetter, the philological work on the Four Truths by K.R. Norman, the textual studies by Richard Gombrich, and the research on early meditation methods by Johannes Bronckhorst. Topic. Scholarly positions According to Schmidhausen, three positions held by scholars of Buddhism can be distinguished regarding the possibility to extract the earliest Buddhism. Stress on the fundamental homogeneity and substantial authenticity of at least a considerable part of the Nikayach materials. Skepticism with regard to the possibility of retrieving the doctrine of earliest Buddhism. Cautious optimism in this respect. Topic: Optimism regarding the early Buddhist texts. In his History of Indian Buddhism, 1988, Etienne Lamotte argues that while it is impossible to say with certainty what the doctrine of the historical Buddha was, it is nonetheless a fact that, in order to appreciate early Buddhism, the only valid evidence, or indication, which we possess is the basic agreement between the Nikayas on the one hand and the Agamas on the other." Likewise, Hajime Nakamura writes in his Indian Buddhism, that, "...there is no word that can be traced with unquestionable authority to Gautama Sakyamuni as a historical personage, although there must be some sayings or phrases derived from him." Nakamura adds that scholars must critically search the early scriptures for the oldest layer of material to find the original Buddhism. Nakamura held that some of the earliest material were the gathas verses found in the Suttanapada, as well as the Sagatha Vaga of the Samyutta Nikaya, the Ativatakas and the Udanas. These texts use less of the doctrinal material that is developed in other texts, are more likely to promote wilderness solitude over communal living and use terminology which is similar to Jain ideas. British Indologist Rupert Gethin writes that, It is extremely likely that at least some of the suttas in the four main Nikayas are among the oldest surviving Buddhist texts and contain material that goes back directly to the Buddha. Gethin agrees with Lamott that the doctrinal basis of the Pali Nikayas and Chinese Agamas is remarkably uniform and 
constitute the common ancient heritage of Buddhism. Richard Gombrich agrees that the four Nikayas and the main body of monastic rules present such originality, intelligence, grandeur, and most relevantly coherence, that it is hard to see it as a composite work, and thus concludes that it is the work of one genius, even if he agrees that when it comes to the Buddha's biography, we know next to nothing. Peter Harvey affirms that the four older Nikayas preserve an early common stock, which must derive from his the Buddha's teachings, because the overall harmony of the texts suggest a single authorship, even while other parts of the Pali Canon clearly originated later. The Canadian Indologist A.K. Warder writes that we are on safe ground only with those texts the authenticity of which is admitted by all schools of Buddhism including the Mahayana, who admit the authenticity of the early canons as well as their own texts not with texts only accepted by certain schools." Warder adds that when the extant material of the Tipitakas of the early Buddhist schools is examined, "...we find an agreement which is substantial, though not complete," and that there is a central body of sutras which is so similar in all known versions that we must accept these as so many recensions of the same original texts." Alexander Wynne has also argued for the historical authenticity of the early Buddhist texts contra skeptics like Gregory Chopin based on the internal textual evidence found inside them as well as archaeological and inscriptional evidence. As noted by T.W. Rhys Davids, Wynne points out the Pali texts depict a pre Asakan North India and he also cites K. R. Norman who argues that they show no Sinhalese Prakrit editions. Reviewing the literature by figures such as Frauwallner, Wynne argues that the Pali suttas reached Sri Lanka by 250 BCE and that they preserved certain details about 5th century North India such as that Yudhika Ramaputta lived near Rajagurha. Wynne concludes, the corresponding pieces of textual material found in the canons of the different sects, especially the literature of the Pali school, which was more isolated than the others, probably go back to pre-sectarian times. It is unlikely that these correspondences could have been produced by the joint endeavor of different Buddhist sects, for such an undertaking would have required organization on a scale which was simply inconceivable in the ancient world. We must conclude that a careful examination of early Buddhist literature can reveal aspects of the pre asakan history of Indian Buddhism. Skepticism One of the early Western skeptics was French Indologist Émile Senert, who argued in his essay Sur la légende du Buddha that the legends of Buddha's life were derived from pre-Buddhist myths of solar deities. The late Edward Kahn's held that there was an absence of hard facts regarding the first period of Buddhism and regarding the teachings of the Buddha. None of his sayings is preserved in its original form. Since we only possess a small fraction of the Buddhist literature that must have circulated during the early period, Kahn's held that all the scholarly attempts to reconstruct the original teachings were all mere guesswork because that which we have may have been composed at any time during the first 500 years. And, there is no objective criterion which would allow us to single out those elements in the record which go back to the Buddha himself. Khans argues that comparative study using the sources of different schools could give us some knowledge of the pre sectarian period doctrine, but he adds that such knowledge might not take us to the earliest period after the Buddha's nirvana, which is a period that is shrouded in mystery and to which we cannot penetrate. Japanese Buddhologist Kogan Mizuno argues in his Buddhist Sutras 1982, that the material we possess may not contain the actual words of the Buddha because they were not recorded as he spoke, but compiled after his death and also because they do not survive in the original language some form of Magadhi Prakrit but transmitted in other Indic languages of later periods, and without doubt conscious and unconscious changes in the Buddha's words were made during several centuries of oral transmission. Mizuno does note that Pali is the oldest of these, but it is still different than Old Magadhi and it is from a different region Western India. Ronald M. Davidson, a scholar of Tantric Buddhism, while acknowledging that most scholars agree that the early community maintained and transmitted a rough body of sacred literature, writes that, "...we have little confidence that much, if any, of surviving Buddhist scripture is actually the word of the historical Buddha." His view is that, more persuasively, the Buddhist order in India might be considered the greatest scriptural composition community in human history. 
Given the extraordinary extent of the material passing at any one time under rubric of the Word of the Buddha, we might simply pause and acknowledge that Indian Buddhists were extraordinarily facile literateurs. The American scholar Gregory Chopin holds that we cannot know anything definite about the actual doctrinal content of the Nikaya Agama literature much before the fourth century CE. Chopin is very critical of modern Buddhist studies because of its preference for literary evidence that in most cases cannot actually be dated and that survives only in very recent manuscript traditions that have been heavily edited and were intended as normative not historical accounts. Chopin believes that the preference for texts over archaeology and epigraphy is a mistake and that it is Buddhist epigraphy which are the earliest written sources. Regarding the textual sources, Chopin holds that even the oldest sources such as the Pali Canon cannot be taken back further than the last quarter of the 1st century BCE, the date of the Aluvihara redaction", but that actually it is not until the 5th or 6th centuries CE, that we can know anything definite about the actual contents of this canon. He notes that references to Tipitaka and Nikaya date from much later periods than the Asakan era such as Kaniska's reign. Only a few texts have been identified in Ahsoka's edicts such as his Babra edict, but these are all short verse texts and are nothing like the suttas of the first and second Nikayas. Chopin concludes that it is only, "...from the end of the 4th century, that some of the doctrinal content of Hinayana canonical literature can finally be definitely dated and actually verified." Regarding the view of comparative critical scholars that agreement between the different sectarian texts points to a common early source, Chopin counters that since this kind of higher criticism is already being done on texts which belong to uniformly late stages of the literary tradition, Chopin believes instead that the agreement was produced by the sharing of literature and ideas between the different sects at a later date. Chopin defines this position as, if all known versions of a text or passage agree, that text or passage is probably late, that is, it probably represents the results of the conflation and gradual leveling and harmonization of earlier existing traditions. Citing Barrow and Wassilief, he holds that it is just as likely that textual agreement among the different canons was produced by parallel development and contact between the different Indian traditions. Topic. Scher's view of an alternate tradition A separate stance has been taken by Polish scholar Stanislaw Scheyer, who argued in the 1930s that the Nikayas preserve elements of an archaic form of Buddhism which is close to Brahmanical beliefs, and survived in the Mahayana tradition. As noted by Alexander Wynne, Scheyer drew on passages, in which consciousness seems to be the ultimate reality or substratum e.g. I. 10, as well as the Sadhatu Sutra, which is not found in any canonical source but is cited in other Buddhist texts. Quote, According to Scheyer, contrary to popular opinion, the Theravada and Mahayana traditions may be divergent, but equally reliable records of a pre-canonical Buddhism which is now lost forever. Quote, the Mahayana tradition may have preserved a very old pre-canonical tradition, which was largely, but not completely, left out of the Theravada canon, Scheer searched in the early texts for ideas that contradict the dominant doctrinal positions of the early canon. According to Scheer, these ideas have been transmitted by a tradition old enough and considered to be authoritative by the compilers of the canon. The last conclusion follows of itself, these texts representing ideas and doctrines contradictory to the generally admitted canonical viewpoint are survivals of older, precanonical Buddhism. Rigami has identified four points which are central to Scheer's reconstruction of precanonical Buddhism. The Buddha was considered as an extraordinary being, in whom ultimate reality was embodied, and who was an incarnation of the mythical figure of the Tathagata. The Buddha's disciples were attracted to his spiritual charisma and supernatural authority. Nirvana was conceived as the attainment of immortality, and the gaining of a deathless sphere from which there would be no falling back. This nirvana, as a transmundane reality or state, is incarnated in the person of the Buddha. Nirvana can be reached because it already dwells as the inmost consciousness of the human being. It is a consciousness which is not subject to birth and death. According to Ray, Scheer has shown a second doctrinal position alongside that of the more dominant tradition, one likely to be of at least equivalent, if not of greater, antiquity. According to Edward Kahn's, Scheer's views are merely a tentative hypothesis 
and that it is also possible that these ideas later entered Buddhism, as a concession to popular demand, just as the lower goal of birth in heaven was admitted side by side with nirvana." Khans thought that both were equally possible. <laughs> Teachings of earliest Buddhism The Dhammakakapavatana Sutta is regarded by the Buddhist tradition as the first discourse of the Buddha. Scholars have noted some persistent problems with this view. Originally the text may only have pointed at the middle way as being the core of the Buddha's teaching, which pointed to the practice of dhyana. This basic term may have been extended with descriptions of the Eightfold Path, itself a condensation of a longer sequence. Some scholars believe that under pressure from developments in Indian religiosity, which began to see liberating insight as the essence of moksha, the Four Noble Truths were then added as a description of the Buddha's liberating insight. Topic. Death, rebirth and karma According to Tilman Vedder, the Buddha at first sought the deathless, amata, amrta, which is concerned with the here and now. According to Edward Kahn's, death was an error which could be overcome by those who entered the doors to the deathless, the gates of the undying. According to Kahn's, the Buddha saw death as a sign that something has gone wrong with us. The Buddha saw death as brought on by an evil force, Mara, the killer, who tempts us away from our true immortal selves and diverts us from the path which could lead us back to freedom. Our cravings keep us tied to Mara's realm. By releasing our attachments we move beyond his realm, and gain freedom from samsara, the beginningless movement of death and rebirth. Karma is the intentional satana actions which keep us tied to samsara. Two views on the liberation from samsara can be discerned in the shramanic movements. Originally karma meant physical and mental activity. One solution was to refrain from any physical or mental activity. The other solution was to see the real self as not participating in these actions, and to disidentify with those actions. According to Bronckhorst, the Buddha rejected both approaches. Nevertheless, these approaches can also be found in the Buddhist tradition, such as the four formless jhanas, and disidentification from the constituents of the self. Bruce Matthews notes that there is no cohesive presentation of karma in the Sutta Pitaka, which may mean that the doctrine was incidental to the main perspective of early Buddhist soteriology. Schmidthausen is a notable scholar who has questioned whether karma already played a role in the theory of rebirth of earliest Buddhism. According to Schmidthausen, the karma doctrine may have been incidental to early Buddhist soteriology. According to Vedder, the deathless amata, amrta, is concerned with the here and now. Only after this realization did he become acquainted with the doctrine of rebirth. Bronckhorst disagrees, and concludes that the Buddha introduced a concept of karma that differed considerably from the commonly held views of his time. According to Bronckhorst, not physical and mental activities as such were seen as responsible for rebirth, but intentions and desire. Topic. Soul According to Bronckhorst, referring to Frau Wallner, Schmidhausen and Bhattacharya, it is possible that original Buddhism did not deny the existence of the soul. Topic. The Four Noble Truths K.R. Norman concluded that the earliest version of the Dhamma Kaka Pavitana Sutra Sutta did not contain the word noble, but was added later. Lambert Schmidhausen concluded that the Four Truths were a later development in early Buddhism. Carol Anderson, following Lambert Schmidhausen and K.R. Norman, notes that the Four Truths are missing in critical passages in the canon, and states, the Four Noble Truths were probably not part of the earliest strata of what came to be recognized as Buddhism, but that they emerged as a central teaching in a slightly later period that still preceded the final redactions of the various Buddhist canons. The Four Truths probably entered the Sutta Pitaka from the Vinaya, the rules for monastic order. They were first added to Enlightenment stories which contain the four jhanas, replacing terms for liberating insight. From there they were added to the biographical stories of the Buddha, it is more likely that the Four Truths are an addition to the biographies of the Buddha and to the Dhammakakapavatana Sutta. According to both Bronckhorst and Anderson, the Four Truths became a substitution for prajna, or liberating insight, 
in the suttas in those texts where liberating insight was preceded by the four jhanas. According to Bronckhorst, the four truths may not have been formulated in earliest Buddhism, and did not serve in earliest Buddhism as a description of liberating insight. Gautama's teachings may have been personal, adjusted to the need of each person. This replacement was probably caused by the influence and pressures of the wider Indian religious landscape, which claimed that one can be released only by some truth or higher knowledge. The Noble Eightfold Path According to Tilman Vedder, the description of the Buddhist path may initially have been as simple as the term, the middle way. In time, this short description was elaborated, resulting in the description of the Eightfold Path. Vedder and Bucknell both note that longer descriptions of the path can be found, which can be condensed into the Noble Eightfold Path. One of those longer sequences, from the Kulahathipadopama Sutta, the Lesser discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprints is as follows Dhammalsadalpabhaja, a layman hears a Buddha teach the Dhamma, comes to have faith in him, and decides to take ordination as a monk. Sila, he adopts the moral precepts. Indriyasamvara, he practices guarding the six sense doors. Sati Sampajana, he practices mindfulness and self possession, actually described as mindfulness of the body, Kayanupasana. Jhana 1, he finds an isolated spot in which to meditate, purifies his mind of the hindrances nivarana, and attains the first rupa jhana. Jhana 2, he attains the second jhana. Jhana 3, he attains the third jhana. Jhana 4, he attains the fourth jhana. Pubhanivasanasati nana, he recollects his many former existences in samsara. Satanam kutapapata nana, he observes the death and rebirth of beings according to their karmas. Asavakaya nana, he brings about the destruction of the asavas inflow, mental bias, and attains a profound realization of as opposed to mere knowledge about the Four Noble Truths. The Mati, he perceives that he is now liberated, that he has done what was to be done. <laughs> Satipatthana According to Zhegosh Polak, the four upasana have been misunderstood by the developing Buddhist tradition, including Theravada, to refer to four different foundations. According to Polak, the four upasana do not refer to four different foundations, but to the awareness of four different aspects of raising mindfulness. The six sense bases which one needs to be aware of Contemplation on Vedanas, which arise with the contact between the senses and their objects the altered states of mind to which this practice leads chitanupasana. The development from the five hindrances to the seven factors of enlightenment dhyana According to Bronckhorst, dhyana was a Buddhist invention, whereas Alexander Wynne argues that dhyana was incorporated from Brahmanical practices, in the Nikayas ascribed to Alara Kalama and Yudhika Ramaputta. These practices were paired to mindfulness and insight, and given a new interpretation. Kalupahana argues that the Buddha reverted to the meditational practices he had learned from Alara Kalama and Yudhika Ramaputta. Norman notes that the Buddha's way to release was by means of meditative practices. Gombrich also notes that a development took place in early Buddhism resulting in a change in doctrine, which considered prajna to be an alternative means to Enlightenment. Topic: <inaudible> Dhyana and insight. A core problem in the study of early Buddhism is the relation between dhyana and insight. The Buddhist tradition has incorporated two traditions regarding the use of dhyana, jhana. There is a tradition that stresses attaining insight, bodhi, prajna, kensho, as the means to awakening and liberation. But it has also incorporated the yogic tradition, as reflected in the use of jhana, which is rejected in other sutras as not achieving the final result of liberation. The problem was famously voiced in 1936 by Louis de la Valle Poussin, in his text Musala et Narada, Le Chemin de Nirvana. Schmidhausen notes that the mention of the Four Noble Truths as constituting liberating insight, which is attained after mastering the Rupa Jhanas, is a later addition to texts such as Majjhima Nikaya 36. 
Schmidhausen discerns three possible roads to liberation as described in the suttas, to which Vedder adds the sole practice of dhyana itself, which he sees as the original, liberating practice. The four rupa jhanas themselves constituted the core liberating practice of early Buddhism, c. q. the Buddha. Mastering the four rupa jhanas, whereafter, liberating insight is attained. Mastering the four rupa jhanas and the four arupa jhanas, whereafter, liberating insight is attained. Liberating insight itself suffices. This problem has been elaborated by several well known scholars, including Tilman Vetter, Johannes Bronckhorst, and Richard Gombrich. <laughs> Samadhi and insight Traditionally, meditation is often described as samadhi, one pointed concentration, and dhyana and samadhi are often referred to interchangeably. Yet, Schmidhausen, Vetter, and Bronckhorst note that the attainment of insight and mindfulness, which is a cognitive activity, cannot be possible in a state wherein all cognitive activity has ceased. Vetter notes that, penetrating abstract truths and penetrating them successively does not seem possible in a state of mind which is without contemplation and reflection. According to Richard Gombrich, the sequence of the four rupa jhanas describes two different cognitive states. Alexander Wynne further explains that the dhyana scheme is poorly understood. According to Wynne, words expressing the inculcation of awareness, such as sati, sampahano, and upekka, are mistranslated or understood as particular factors of meditative states, whereas they refer to a particular way of perceiving the sense objects. According to Gombrich, the later tradition has falsified the jhana by classifying them as the quintessence of the concentrated, calming kind of meditation, ignoring the other, and indeed higher, element. According to Vetter and Bronckhorst, dhyana itself constituted the original liberating practice. Vetter further argues that the Eightfold Path constitutes a body of practices which prepare one, and led up to, the practice of dhyana. <laughs> liberating insight Discriminating insight into transiency as a separate path to liberation was a later development. According to Johannes Bronckhorst, Tilman Vetter, and K. R. Norman, Bodhi was at first not specified. K. R. Norman It is not at all clear what gaining Bodhi means. We are accustomed to the translation, enlightenment, for Bodhi, but this is misleading. It is not clear what the Buddha was awakened to, or at what particular point the awakening came. According to Norman, Bodhi may basically have meant the knowledge that Nibbana was attained, due to the practice of dhyana. Bronckhorst notes that the conception of what exactly this liberating insight was developed throughout time. Whereas originally it may not have been specified, later on the four truths served as such, to be superseded by Pratityasamutpada, and still later, in the Hinayana schools, by the doctrine of the non existence of a substantial self or person. And Schmidhausen notices that still other descriptions of this liberating insight exist in the Buddhist canon. That the five skandhas are impermanent, disagreeable, and neither the self nor belonging to oneself. The contemplation of the arising and disappearance of the five skandhas. The realization of the skandhas as empty and without any pith or substance the developing importance of liberating insight may have been to do an over-literal interpretation by later scholastics of the terminology used by the Buddha, or to the problems involved with the practice of dhyana, and the need to develop an easier method. According to Vedder it may not have been as effective as dhyana, and methods were developed to deepen the effects of discriminating insight. Insight was also paired to dhyana, resulting in the well-known Sila Samadhi Prajna scheme. According to Vedder this kind of preparatory dhyana must have been different from the practice introduced by the Buddha, using kasina exercises to produce a more artificially produced dhyana, resulting in the cessation of apperceptions and feelings. It also led to a different understanding of the Eightfold Path, since this path does not end with insight, but rather starts with insight. The path was no longer seen as a sequential development resulting in dhyana, but as a set of practices which had to be developed simultaneously to gain insight. According to Alexander Wynne, the ultimate aim of dhyana was the attainment of insight, and the application of the meditative state to the practice of mindfulness. According to Frau Wallner, mindfulness was a means to prevent the arising of craving, which resulted simply from contact between the senses and their objects. 
According to Frauwallner this may have been the Buddha's original idea. According to Wynne, this stress on mindfulness may have led to the intellectualism which favored insight over the practice of dhyana. Topic. Dependent origination While Pratityasamutpada, dependent origination, and the twelve nidanas, the links of dependent origination, are traditionally interpreted as describing the conditional arising of rebirth in samsara, and the resultant dukkha suffering, pain, unsatisfactoriness. An alternate Theravada questions the authenticity of this interpretation, and regards the list as describing the arising of mental formations and the resultant notion of I and mine, which are the source of suffering. Scholars have noted inconsistencies in the list, and regard it to be a later synthesis of several older lists. The first four links may be a mockery of the Vedic Brahmanic cosmogony, as described in the Hymn of Creation of Veda X, 129 and the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. These were integrated with a branch list which described the conditioning of mental processes, akin to the five skandhas. Eventually, this branch list developed into the standard twelvefold chain as a linear list. While this list may be interpreted as describing the processes which give rise to rebirth, in essence it describes the arising of dukkha as a psychological process, without the involvement of an Atman. Topic. 37 factors of enlightenment According to A. K. Warder the Bodhipakyadama, the 37 factors of enlightenment, are a summary of the core Buddhist teachings which are common to all schools. These factors are summarized in the Maha Parinibbana Sutta, which recounts the Buddha's last days, in the Buddha's last address to his bhikkhus. Now, O bhikkhus, I say to you that these teachings of which I have direct knowledge and which I have made known to you, these you should thoroughly learn, cultivate, develop, and frequently practice, that the life of purity may be established and may long endure, for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well-being, and happiness of gods and men, and what, bhikkhus, are these teachings? They are the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four constituents of psychic power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the noble eightfold path. These, bhikkhus, are the teachings of which I have direct knowledge, which I have made known to you, and which you should thoroughly learn, cultivate, develop, and frequently practice. Alex Wayman has criticized A.K. Warder, for failing to present an integrated picture of early Buddhism. But according to Gethin, the Bodhipakyadama provide a key to understanding the relationship between calm and insight in early Buddhist meditation theory, bringing together the practice of jhana with the development of wisdom. Topic. Nirvana Topic. A cessation and ending of rebirth Most modern scholars such as Rupert Gethin, Richard Gombrich and Paul Williams hold that the goal of early Buddhism, nirvana nibbana in Pali, also called nibbanadhatu, the property of nibbana, means the blowing out or extinguishing of greed, aversion, and delusion the simile used in texts is that of a flame going out, and that this signifies the permanent cessation of samsara and rebirth. As Gethin notes, this is not a thing but an event or experience that frees one from rebirth in samsara. Gombrich argues that the metaphor of blowing out refers to fires which were kept by priests of Brahmanism, and symbolize life in the world. According to Donald Swearer, the journey to nirvana is not a journey to a separate reality, but a move towards calm, equanimity, non attachment, and non self. Thomas Kasulis notes that in the early texts, nirvana is often described in negative terms, including cessation, naroda, the absence of craving, detachment, the absence of delusion, and the unconditioned. Asamskrta. He also notes that there is little discussion in the early Buddhist texts about the metaphysical nature of nirvana, since they seem to hold that metaphysical speculation is an obstacle to the goal. Kasulis mentions the Malunkyaputta Sutta, which denies any view about the existence of the Buddha after his final bodily death. All positions the Buddha exists after death, does not exist, both or neither are rejected. Likewise, another Sutta and 2 161 has Sariputta saying that asking the question, Is there anything else? After the physical death of someone who has attained nibbana is conceptualizing or proliferating papansa about that which is without proliferation a papankam and thus a kind of distorted thinking bound up with the self. Topic. As a kind of consciousness or a place. 
Edward Kahn's argued that nirvana was a kind of absolute. He mentions ideas like the person, pudula, the assumption of an eternal consciousness in the Sadhatu Sutra, the identification of the absolute, of nirvana, with an invisible infinite consciousness, which shines everywhere, in Diga Nikaya 1185, and traces of a belief in consciousness as the nonimpermanent center of the personality which constitutes an absolute element in this contingent world as pointing to this. Influenced by Scheer, M. Falk argues that the early Buddhist view of nirvana is that it is an abode, or place, of prajna, which is gained by the enlightened. This nirvanic element, as an essence, or pure consciousness, is immanent within samsara. The three bodies are concentric realities, which are stripped away or abandoned, leaving only the niradhakaya of the liberated person. A similar view is also defended by C. Lintner, who argues that in precanonical Buddhism nirvana is a place one can actually go to. It is called nirvanadhatu, has no border signs animita, is localized somewhere beyond the other six dhatas beginning with earth and ending with vijnana but is closest to akasa and vijnana. One cannot visualize it, it is anadarsana, but it provides one with firm ground under one's feet, it is dhruva, once there one will not slip back, it is asayudapada. As opposed to this world, it is a pleasant place to be in, it is sukha, things work well. According to Lintner, canonical Buddhism was a reaction to this view, but also against the absolutist tendencies in Jainism and the Upanishads. Nirvana came to be seen as a state of mind, instead of a concrete place. Elements of this precanonical Buddhism may have survived the canonization, and its subsequent filtering out of ideas, and reappeared in Mahayana Buddhism. According to Lintner, the existence of multiple, and contradicting ideas, is also reflected in the works of Nagarjuna, who tried to harmonize these different ideas. According to Lintner, this led him to taking a paradoxical Stance, for instance regarding nirvana, rejecting any positive description, referring to this view, Alexander Wynne holds that there is no evidence in the Sutta Pitaka that the Buddha held this view, at best it only shows that, some of the early Buddhists were influenced by their Brahmanic peers. Wynne concludes that the Buddha rejected the views of the Vedas and that his teachings present a radical departure from these Brahmanical beliefs. See also Athakavaga and Parayanavaga Buddhist paths to liberation Basic points unifying the Theravada and the Mahayana Buddhist councils History of Buddhism Outline of Buddhism Topic. Notes Topic. Quotations Topic. References Topic Sources Topic Printed Sources Topic Web Sources Topic Further Reading History of Buddhism General Bronkhorst, Johannes 1993, The Two Traditions of Meditation in Ancient India, Mudalal Banarsidas Publ. Gombrich, Richard F. 1997, How Buddhism Began, Munshiram Manoharlal Norman, K. R. A Philological Approach to Buddhism. The Bukkyo Dendo Kyoke Lectures 1994 PDF, School of Oriental and African Studies University of London Samuel, Jeffrey 2010, The Origins of Yoga and Tantra. Indic Religions to the 13th Century, Cambridge University Presserly Buddhism Schmidhausen, Lambert 1981, on some aspects of descriptions or theories of liberating insight and enlightenment in early Buddhism. In, Studien zum Jainismus und Buddhismus Gedenkschrift für Ludwig Alsdorf, HRSG, von Klaus Brun und Albrecht Wessler, Wiesbaden 1981, 199-250 Vetter, Tillmann The Ideas and Meditative Practices of Early Buddhism, Brill Wynne, Alexander 2007, The Origin of Buddhist Meditation, Routledge Modern Understanding Topic. External links 
A handful of leaves essential publications on Buddhist history Louis de la Vallée Poussin, Musial and Narod. Translated from the French by Jalongma Migma Chodron and Jalong Lodro Sangpo. Venn. Sujato 2006, Sects and Sectarianism, The Origins of Buddhist Schools. <laughs>